himself. He'll be our MC for this evening. Uh, and I uh, also wanted to mention that we do have a great membership program. Uh, members get in free all year round, and we do have a fundraiser coming up soon on May 23rd at Masada uh, Mediterranean Grill in Logan Square. So we'll be on the lookout on our website for us for a good cause. Uh, I definitely want to welcome you again. If you can, please put your phones on silent. We are going to record if you have a problem with being on the video. Just let us know afterwards and uh, we'll make sure to edit your portion out. Uh, we're going to try to share this with the rest of the world too on our website. So hopefully uh, you guys have some great stories to tell and looking forward to a good night. Uh, David, if you want to take it away from here. Uh, yeah. First, I just wanted to say welcome to everyone. I see a lot of familiar faces, but I also am really, really, really happy to see a lot of uh, people here that I haven't seen it into it. So welcome. Um, I hope you all have a chance to see the show. If not, please check it out afterwards. And um, I think this is going to be a fun night. Um, many of you knew Lee Godi or spent time with her or were chased down the street by her or <laughs> have a great story to tell and others know of her or just appreciate her work. And so we all just wanted to get together and kind of uh, share some stories and um, talk a little bit about why we think the work is important. And this uh, particular show, of course, focuses on the self-portrait photographs that Lee made. Um, for, for so long, most people who encountered Lee really knew her because of her painting. And um, over the course of time, this body of work has really emerged to become a, a substantial, important part of her, of her um, output. So I know uh, some of you may know the bigger kind of legody story, and, and some don't. So I'll give you some uh, a little bit of insight into who she was and what she was all about, and then we can um, talk a little bit and share some stories. So, when I think about Ligoti, I, I think of kind of three groups of people over the course of time. There was a very early, early group, some of them are here, um, that would be the late 60s, early 70s, students at the Art Institute, uh, people who worked at the bookstore at the Art Institute who encountered her. And then there was a, a do we have someone here? And, um, and then we have a, a, a kind of a middle group um, that were artists and, and collectors, and then we have a, a later group of people who spent time with her late in life. And I kind of I fall into that third category, um, and so I'll share a few of, of my uh, stories with you to get things rolling. But um, Jamo Emily Godey uh, first began selling her paintings on the steps of the Art Institute of Chicago in 1968, announcing that she had canvases for sale, and that she was quote much better than Cezanne. <coughs> From that day on, Lee proclaimed herself a French Impressionist and sold her idealized portraits, becoming one of the most collected artists in Chicago. The paintings of glamorous women wearing elaborate jewelry, uh, holding bunches of roses, have titles like The Girl with the Golden Curls, Flaming Youth, uh, and there are also images of handsome men uh, that are often called Prince of the City. First, as I said, they were sold to students at the Art Institute, and then later to uh, uh, passers-by on Michigan Avenue, where she was mostly perched. Um, Lee would wait for a well-dressed patron to walk by, and she would approach them about a sale. So it was difficult to just walk up to her and say, I want to buy that. It was a very orchestrated uh, sale that she, she wanted the interaction to be a part of it. So there was a little bit of performance art going on there, uh, which, is, which is kind of great. And the photos uh, all play into that, and, and we'll, we'll get to that part. So she'd look for a well-dressed patron to walk by and approach them about a sale. Uh, she'd carefully select her buyers that she felt were sophisticated enough to appreciate the beauty of her work. Many people sought her out, looking for the woman with the thick black eyebrows painted above her real ones, and bright orange circles painted on her cheeks, all applied to the same, same paint box that she made her, her artworks from. <laughs> she was really hard to miss. 
Her clothing consisted of pieces of fabric wrapped around her pins like a makeshift sari, uh, and she wore her uh, famous fur coat uh, that was probably many fur coats patched together over the course of, of many years. Uh, she rarely wore pants, as she considered them unladylike, um, and she often adorned herself and her canvases with cheap cameo brooches that she would buy with the money that she would make from the sale of the paintings. She mostly slept outside, only conceiving to go indoors when the bitter Chicago winter forced it. She would then take up residence at local transient hotels, but even then she preferred sleeping out on the fire escape. She, she felt that the buildings were fire traps, and she also felt that it was healthier to sleep and breathe in um, the, the natural air, not be cooped up in a room. The paintings for which Lee's best known for were, according to her, an expression of beauty. She told me once that she took up painting on the advice of a redbird because her career as a poet was, wasn't really going anywhere. No one was, was interested in buying work, so she needed to shift, and uh, thankfully she did. Uh, beauty was first and foremost with Lee, and the grim reality of her life on the streets really never in, entered into the conversations that I had with her. Um, she discussed the colors in a painting that she was working on, the dress of a stylish woman walking by, but um, everything was focused on this concept of, of beauty and how she was going to capture it. She lived her life as an artist, focusing on beauty and, ex and uh, expressing that in the thousands of paintings that she produced. Um, Often, there are many works that are unfinished, and so, um, you know, at, at, at galleries and museums, what we really try to focus on is putting out the best examples of the work, the totally finished work. You have to understand that in the um, contemporary and commercial art world, there are layers of filtering. The artists themselves filter their work, then their gallerist comes and filters the work, and then the collectors who are buying from the galleries filter the work for what they prefer. So there's, the work is highly edited, where this work, there was no editing. Work was being produced and sold and, and bought and traded, and so it's a little bit of everything out there. So we really do try to hone in on, the, on key pieces, and you'll see some really nice ones in the show today. Um, after some time, Lee became concerned that her buying public might not accept the paintings things of such beauty were actually produced by her. So she devised a plan to authenticate them and authenticate her status as an artist. By the way, I wanted to just say that I'm showing um, photographs that were taken by Steve Kagan, uh, a wonderful photographer. These were shot for People magazine in 1986. And what's really amazing about these images is that um, Here's a great example of one where she's on her way to work in the morning, just like anyone else with their briefcase. She you know, woke up, she got her stuff together, and she was going to go find her spot to start painting and selling. Uh, her artistic production took forms far beyond painting, though, and they included the creation of her own artistic identity, as well as her writings, poetry, short stories, and her photography. Uh, Still dominated by portraiture, the body of photography consists solely of self-portraits, and it reveals a self-investigation that's also expressed in her writings uh, and journals. So with the money made from the sale of her paintings, Lee began to purchase props. She would buy lace scarves, silver goblets, and dozens of roses. Um, even the money itself became a prop to use in the nearly 300 black and white photo booth portraits. The photos were taken at the Trailways bus station at Union Station, uh, and the photos were all one-offs, so there's no negative. Um, and then ultimately they were sewn onto the paintings. The interested buyer then would be given the option to pay a higher price for a painting and photo combination. Uh, if the price was questioned, the photo was sometimes removed, and the painting price lowered. And sometimes if Lee felt insulted by the deal, which is she would, the whole thing would fall apart, and it would just end in, again, being chased down. Um, I once asked her, um, 
about the photos and why she took them. And she told me that the paintings were so beautiful that she really feared that people wouldn't believe that she made them. Um, so it's estimated that she, there are about 300 of the photos. And um, she, again, she attached most to the paintings. And they, they really were like an elaborate signature. Um, and it, it kind of fulfilled her need to be recognized as an artist. Occasionally in the photos, they would hold up a painting that the photo was going to be sewn onto as further proof of authorship. But more often than not, the photos were vehicles for Lido Express and make concrete her longing for femininity, beauty, and success. And you'll see in a lot of the photos, she's waving fans of uh, $20 bills. Um, that would basically just be signifying that you know I am a successful artist. In other ones, it's more about feminine beauty. She drops her shirt to reveal her shoulders and collarbones, which she believed were the sexiest part of a woman's body. Um, and you'll see a few of those in the show. Uh, in these images, she secured a place for herself in the world of high society. She's blurring lines between her life in the street and that of her patrons, transforming herself into one of the beautiful people, the femme fatales of her paintings. Interestingly, Godi hated being photographed by others and was known to attack people who dared to try. So a lot of people, I've witnessed so many people coming by to try to take a snapshot and she would just go nuts. But really what that boils down to is, is that you know, she was really um, controlling her, her own image. And you know, when you think about any celebrity, they're totally in control of their image and she was just doing the same thing. So it, was, uh, it felt like natural to her because she at this point had really in her mind elevated herself and really in the minds of a lot of, of collectors. Uh, she was elevated as, a, as an artist, and she wanted to kind of uh, maintain that identity. There's a formality to the photographs, um, and that can be seen in her calculated intentions for each piece. The images are very controlled, and they allow her to explore and document her multifaceted identity. So with the use of the props, costumes, and makeup, which was uh, sometimes her paint, but also she occasionally would use Lipton iced tea mix, and apply a little water to it and put it on her face. And you'll notice some photos in the exhibit where she has a very dark face, and that's the tea. Um, it would give a, a, a high contrast effect in the photo booth, and she liked that. Um, she'd often take on different personas in the photos, ranging from shrewd businesswoman fanning herself with $20 or $100 bills, to a sophisticated socialite with cameo brooches pinned to her lapel, or a silver goblet in her hand. With exaggerated facial expressions, she added personality that works. Mischievous, with a raised eyebrow, aloof, looking into the distance, or pensive, with hands crossed, crossed her chest. After the image was taken, she then began post-production. The straight image just didn't seem to be enough. Uh, so Lee, the consummate artist, manipulated the photos, continuing to enhance the image with her unique methods of dodging and burning. She would use a pencil eraser in some places to brighten her skin, and sometimes, sometimes to the point of obliterating all details in her face to make it uh, porcelain smooth. Uh, and then she would go back and draw in the missing parts with a ballpoint pen. And almost all of the photos are enhanced in some way or another, some more than, more than others, but for the most part, she really was work, reworking these after they came out of the photo booth. She would extend her eyelashes, color her lips and fingernails. These were all evidence of these uh, quest for femininity and beauty. And it all culminated in a, a really a deliberate exploration and transformation of, of herself and her identity. Uh, written on the backs of the photos are messages, uh, things like, I, a woman, or, as you can see, I make my money with my brush. Um, and those all really further secure her status as an artist. Here she is in action. Maybe a sale, maybe not. If he had jeans on, it would not be a sale. Uh, this is a, an early painting she did, um, which you know may be the red bird that told her to start painting, but it's 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 a nice red bird. And Lee really um, had this strong connection with birds, and I I really think part of it was the birds to her represented freedom, this ability to move from one place to another very easily, and I think she saw herself that way, moving around the city. 
And so there was a connection. And the birds, for years and years, really continued through, the, through her body of work just as much as the, uh, the celebrity portraits that she did. When, she, when Lee would do an actual celebrity painting, like uh, Joan Crawford or um, James Dean, she would deliberately try to not make it too realistic because she was afraid of being sued. Um, there's one example of a James Dean painting that she ended up crossing out the name James Dean on the back and writing an artist and putting a mustache on it. So slightly disguising it just to make sure she didn't get into trouble. Um, there's a painting in the gallery of uh, the Hessian soldier and he's in a red jacket and this is a companion painting to that. So maybe you can look at that and then when you go back out into the gallery, look at the other one and you'll see a nice this is a piece that I really think is a masterpiece of hers. It's, uh, it kind of does it all. She's got a beautiful woman um, wearing her three-dimensional brooch. And then, in this case, Lee has actually used the self-portrait and isolated it as a piece of artwork and part of, part of the piece. So I think this is a, a, really, important, um, a really important piece, and I think it, it really illustrates how she saw these photos as not as snapshots, but as very deliberate and calculated uh, works of art. Um, I would say that you know her these self transformations documented in Chicago's photo booths really allowed her to escape her life as a street woman and identify with the archetypes that she admired. Uh, when you look at the images, you really you see the surface of this manufactured elegance, but you really also see the weight of a woman who experienced a lifetime of hardship. So they're, they're very complex. Um, and the thing that, um, that I guess I would like to stress about them is, is simply that they, um, they are very thought out and staged. And for, for a long time, most of the people that knew Lee or of her really focused on the paintings and didn't really think about these photos. They weren't really considered artwork no one really knew what to make of them. And now that some time has gone by, and also conceptual photography emerged uh, with artists like Cindy Sherman transforming herself, um, oftentimes from a society woman to a, a street person, um, this work has been recognized as, as a significant uh, body of work and, and a really important part of her output. Um, this is a kind of a, a, a nice transitional piece that I wanted to talk about. Um, so as I said, Lee, Lee started out trying to sell poetry and was unsuccessful. But what this is, is it's a poem that she wrote and then after she did that, she went to the photo booth and illustrated it. Um, it's called Six Roses, She Got Red Ones. And um, in a nutshell, what this poem is about is that she bought a half a dozen roses that were buds and she thought that they were so beautiful that she tied each of them shut with a red thread and held them there for, for a few days just to prolong the, the beauty. Mm -hmm. And then on uh, a given day, she gently pulled the threads and, and breathed onto the buds and her warm breath caused the roses to burst open. Uh, and then, so this is a photo of her with the roses and the red thread uh, sewn on to the, to the poem. And I, I think it's really a, a really great piece. So with that, uh, Tom, you're going to come up and, and talk a little. And then I thought what we would do is uh, share some stories. Is that all right? I only have one story um, about Lee. And I tried to, I'm a filmmaker, and uh, I saw her at State and Wacker. Near that fountain, it used to be called the Children's Fountain. Anyone remember that? She was working, and I tried to sneak up on her with my camera. 
And I was sure she wouldn't see me. I was hiding behind the statue of, of, of Washington. And, but she saw me and threw a fit. And so I, I have about this much footage of her uh, screaming at me. Um, uh, but to the point, uh, Capra Fleming and I are doing a film about Lee. Uh, and we're going to show you some clips. Um, at, at the end, we'll show your clip of, uh, of the website. Capra? It is a trailer, Tom. Oh, it's a trailer, but... And then at the end of it, I have uh, what you had gotten of the ABC News uh, oh. program. She's, that was on in she was, she was on local news and also on Peter Jennings' world news. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know when that was? Mm -hmm. Long No? I do. It was I'm a not long time. I, I see. And I saw that. So what we're going to do is show the local, uh, 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 the local news with Carol Marine, who's still on television, Channel 11 mostly, I think. Uh, and then we'll show a little clip of uh, the film uh, a friend of mine, Stanley Garber, who visited who visited her at uh, uh, at the Tokyo Hotel. Both of these are very short clips, and then we'll we'll jump into and maybe David will David mm -hmm. will say something. Sure, great. All right, well let's uh, let's roll. Let's Chicago artist Lee Goatee is now a street person. She was evicted from her apartment at the Ohio East Hotel two weeks ago, not because she didn't pay the rent, but because of the filthy conditions in which she lived. Today, Renee Ferguson is here with a follow-up report. Renee? Well, Carol, Lee Goatee seems to be able to take care of herself on the streets of Chicago. But there is now a question about who will take care of her paintings. Like many of Chicago's homeless, Lee Goatee carries most of her possessions with her in bags. But when she was evicted from the Ohio East Hotel two weeks ago, she left her paintings across the street in the Tree Studios building. Artist Barton Feist, who lives in the building, found them and kept the maintenance man from throwing them away. Feist said, to his surprise, there were almost 400 paintings. What do you think the, the value is? Um... Just in doing, I did some calculations. It could be anywhere from a quarter of a million, half a million on up. Feist has begun photographing and cataloging the works, which include a bluebird made of broken glass from a car windshield, a painting of her own hands on piano keys, birds, and many of her blue-eyed blonde women. Some of the paintings have pictures on both sides of the canvas. Feist says several art dealers have approached him, asking for the paintings, but he plans to leave them in storage. I can't give them up to anyone, just anyone. I have to make sure that I get it to someone that has legal authorization, not just verbal, you know, hearsay. It has to be directly, like either she is with them or a court order. Gallery owner Carl Hammer has sold Godey's paintings for 12 years. He says this is yet one more chapter in the strange life of a schizophrenic woman whose art could make her wealthy, but whose living habits make her homeless. I'm haunted by this nightmare or this dream, which I'm sure is actually more of reality than anything else, that we wake up from day and she's either dead by a blow to the head or she's just you know, she's either died, died of old age or she's frozen to death some night. Hammer says Lee Odie's decision to live on Michigan Avenue, which is relatively safe, is indicative of how smart she is, indicative of the level of her survival skills. She's definitely a person who wants to remain, you know, independent right up until the last. Uh, and so I, you know, I support that. For now, Lee Odie's friends say the best thing to do is leave her alone. When she finds a place to stay for the winter, she'll perhaps also have a place to store her paintings. Carol, come on, stay. All right. Um, uh, where's uh, Where's Joel? Right here. Oh. <laughs> He's hiding back there. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll show now a, a short clip of the film we're doing, uh, uh, where our friend Stanley visits her at the Tokyo Hotel. Um, oh, by the way. There's an interesting story in our film regarding that guy Barton Fife and Carl Hammer. There was uh, when you when, when you buy the DVD when we finish it in 
2000. Next summer. Is it this yeah, summer? Next summer. Oh. Next summer. Uh, there was, it, it's quite an uh, interesting story, uh, what happened to the film, all those pictures that he took, that he grabbed, that he stole. Uh, <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is Lee Goatee, the French Impressionist. I, I had a friend at the time. He, he called me and he said, she's staying at the Tokyo Hotel these days. Why don't we try and go down and see her and see if we can buy some works or whatever. And for the life of me, I have no idea why I said yes, but I did. We walked up to the second floor or something like that. And when we, we got up there, there was a long corridor. There was an open door, and that open door turned out to be her apartment. There were maybe twenty or 30,000 cockroaches that seemed to be emanating from her apartment and going down the hall in various directions. But, uh, you know, I, I, I decided decided to buy some paintings, and, and I did buy at least four. These are two of them. Um, on this one, she says, by Lee Goody, French Impressionist, and on the other one, there's actually no markings, not even her signature. We pretty much spent our time out, out in the hall, although for some reason or other, we went into the room. So there was a little sink in the corner, and she was, at one point, she took a, a water, you know, kid sort of watercolor set that she put by the sink, and the red disappeared quite quickly because a couple of cockroaches went at it. And she was, she was friendly. Um, you know, I've read articles that say she was nutty, but she didn't act nutty. I mean, she's sort of unusual looking and, and attired. And she suggested that she do a portrait of me. You know, she grabbed a pencil, and the pencil broke, and she grabbed a pen, and the pen was out of ink. And then she'd forgotten. She went to go get the red paint. The red paint had already been consumed. She did the outline, sort of, and at least some point before she did the loves, she did uh, uh, come fairly close to me and told me that it would, uh, she'd, do the, she'd be able to do the lips much more effectively if she kissed me or I kissed her. <laughs> and I wanted to, but I'm married, I was married at the time, and that would, you know, wouldn't have been proper. She managed to do the lips, and I'm not sure where she got the red, because it wasn't the red paint, because that was gone. Uh, it's not a very accurate, uh, uh, picture of me, I had a beard and a mustache. I never in my life ever had hair that was sort of straight. So she wrote on the back, this is Stanley Garber. Uh, she misspelled, I, I think she must have tried to use the French pronunciation. Because I guess I read that she called herself Lee Godet, like as in G-O-D-A. And I don't know what we paid for them, maybe thirty-five dollars each or forty dollars each or something like that. And we paid her in cash and I, she would take the cash and she'd go and there was a dresser in the in in the room, it was a single room, she put the money in the in the dresser. It was an unusual uh, I was surprised I did it. I'm glad I did it. And it was sort of out of character, but it was an interesting experience. When the moon comes over the mountain, every beam brings a dream. Hello, everybody. That's the way she said. I, I learned to mimic her because I heard her so many times she denounced herself. That's a, a recording that uh, a friend of ours, Bill Samets, made. And she's singing, um, uh, some of you remember Kate Smith? You're really old if you do. Yeah. Aha! Uh -huh. Someone who, who would sing that all the time when the movie came out. Uh, and and uh, Bill Samets recorded her in front of the Art Institute. And there's a little more to the interview, too, which will. There is more, isn't yes, there? Oh, good. <laughs> all right, I guess we're, we're ready to. Are any questions so far? And otherwise, we'll turn it over to anyone who has a story. And a lot of you do, and I know David does. David, would yes, you like? Yes, yes, Terrific. Thanks, David. Sure, sure, sure. Hello, I'm David uh, Lisisco, and uh, when David Sirik and I were first uh, dating and getting to know each other, we spent a lot of time, most of our dates included Lee Goating. And um, <laughs> David was 
really concerned about her. She was having some hard times, so often we would have to go to the bank and get some money to help her out. Um, and this is all. But you couldn't just give her the money; she yeah. wouldn't accept it. So you had to negotiate a whole purchase of work to get her to take the money. But before uh, I had actually met David, uh, when I first moved to Chicago, fresh out of art school, it was in 1983, and a friend of mine who uh, went, we both went to the same colleges in Cleveland, uh, he had moved to Chicago, and I was working as an illustrator and an artist, and he was trying to, he was a copywriter at Montgomery Boards, but did drawings on the side. He now illustrates Chocolate Town for The New Yorker and has been doing that for the past 15 years. Now he's a highly regarded illustrator and cartoonist. And so we had, it was a beautiful, beautiful day. We had gone swimming uh, at Oak Street Beach. Uh, we had a nice clothes. We were, we were walking. We were walking towards the Michigan Avenue Bridge. We got there and I said, there's Lee Goaty, the, the artist. Uh, we should introduce ourselves. So we went up to, to her and she was eyeing Tom's drawing pad. She was, uh, well, if you show me your drawings, and I guess I'll show you my drawings. <laughs> so then he showed her what he was drawing, and she quickly said, these drawings are ugly. <laughs> They're very ugly, and no one likes ugly artwork. You need to do what the Fresh Impressionists did. They made beautiful artwork, and everyone wanted it. And her other theory was that to sell chocolates, which was something everyone liked, they put the French Impressionist paintings on the chocolate boxes. And that way you've got two for one. You've got great chocolates and you've got great art. So she was telling us this long story about staying out on the Michigan Avenue Bridge for hours and hours and hours, and often at night, seeing the ghost of Marshall Field strolling across, as well as other luminary figures of Chicago. But my favorite story that she told was, again, stressing her great love and appreciation of the French Impressionists was that there was a big French Impressionist exhibit at the Art Institute. And so she went in, but she was very smart because she knew the beauty of it would just be so difficult to get through. So she put a piece of cheese under her armpit and went into the gallery hiding this piece of cheese and went through the exhibition. And when she knew she was going to faint from the sheer beauty she reached under her arm and nibbled on some cheese and saved some more for later. And it gave her the strength to see the entire exhibition, which she just loved very much. My other memory of her is you heard her singing. She sang actually very beautifully. And uh, a song that she sang for us at about 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, right at the water tower. It was raining and we were all hiding, David, I, and her and a woman who eventually we found out was her long lost daughter. But at the time, no one knew who she was. Uh, we just knew that this woman was hanging around Lee Godi a lot, and they were spending lots of time together. And anyway, it was pouring rain, and Lee decided we should all start drawing, so she handed us these pieces of paper. And I, being an artist who works very quickly, I started drawing very quickly, and she said, no, 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 no. It takes a long time to make really good art and you're drawing way too fast. <laughs> it won't be any good if you do it that way. Um, and then she started to sing the song Lullaby on Broadway exquisitely, like so amazing that it sounded, you had mentioned Kate Smith, um, she just sounded totally that she was someone who had listened to things on the radio. And you can see in her penmanship that she had come from a world where she was very, you know, she was used to a, a, a wonderful way of life before a bunch of crises had happened to her that she wound up living on the streets. Um, and I, another favorite story of mine is that uh, it was getting to be uh, fall, and it would, and, and, but it was still sort of like Indian summer was still kind of hot, and David and I saw her standing in the park by the water tower, and uh, she was being bitten by flies. And she was taking ice cream bars and rubbing them on her legs so that the flies would eat the ice cream and not eat her. Oh. And then she said, you know, what we ought to do, we should go to Maury Majors. They're having a big sale on tents. I saw it in the window. We buy a tent, we catch a train to Florida, and we live there from the winter, and we make a lot of money. <laughs> uh, we did not do that with her. But um, she was quite a character, and I'm sure all of you have amazing stories of her as well. But 
the French Impressionist with the cheese is one of my yeah. time favorite yeah. stories. So, all right, please, whoever's next, please come up. Uh, so I'm Donna. This isn't working, is it? Yeah, it's working. Oh, it's working. Okay. Um, I'm Donna Spiegel. And um, the story I'm going to tell, I think, based on what I was wearing, um, probably happened in 1982 or 1983 on a hot summer day after work. And I worked at the Overnet, and um, I would walk down Michigan Avenue and catch the bus at the end to go home most days. And on this particular day, I'll never forget what I was wearing. And now I know why she spoke to me. <laughs> so I had on, uh, I, I had a client presentation that day. I had a client presentation that day, so I was really dressed up. And work was usually casual, but that day I had on a flax linen dress. I'll never forget it. I had on um, a linen and silk uh, pastel herringbone blazer, but the, the kicker was I had on a beautiful strand of cultured pearls, so I'm sure that caught her eye. So I had heard about Lee for a long time through friends that were collecting, and my mother-in-law at that time was a graduate student at the um, Art Institute, and she had a few, but I didn't have one. And so I'm walking down Michigan Avenue, and I see her, and she was sitting on the same bench that uh, was in the film that you showed. Uh, over by the water tower, it was in that exact bench. Mm -hmm. And so I went over there and I introduced myself and she was in the middle of drawing. And um, I thought, wow, maybe I could get what she's drawing if I play my cards right. Mm -hmm. So um, she was working on this um, ink mm -hmm. uh, sketch and her reference, her go-to for this was she had an ad that was learn to draw. And it was a profile of a woman. Now the leaves and the, the birds were, um, you know, her embellishments. So she told me I could sit down and watch her draw. Well, I was there a really long time because I really was going to wait it out because I really wanted this piece. So we're sitting there for a while, and I really can't remember 99% of the conversation, but here's the part I remember. After sitting there for some time, she turned to me and she said, I'm going to have some sun tea. Would you like a cup? And I thought, well, if I want the picture, I guess I'm going to have some sun tea. <laughs> so she takes out these two wet, the thin tea bags out of some bag that she had. And then she pulled out a crumpled cup, one crumpled cup. And she went to the water fountain to put water in it. And then she came back, and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, good, she didn't have two cups, you know. And she said, you're going to need a cup. And I said, Oh, okay, and she pointed to the garbage can, which was, it was the end of the day, so you know, all the Ghirardelli ice cream cones are in there, and the McDonald's cups and all this, and so she said, go get yourself a cup, and then fill it up at the fountain. So I'm thinking, oh my God, this is, I'm really going to go through with this, but how, how can I not do it? And now I'm thinking, she was really playing me, you know, <laughs> so I walk over to the garbage can, and being logical and strategic problem solver, I thought, well, I'll just take one that still has ice in it because that means it hasn't been there that long. You know, and the flies are, are going everywhere. So, uh, and I also thought, you know, if it's near the top, it's, it's fresh, right? So I take the cup out, dump the ice, go fill it with water at the fountain, and I come back, and she gives me the tea bag. And so our two teacups are, are sitting there, and she's continuing to paint. And then she said, I think our tea is ready. <laughs> I'm still am not the owner of the picture, right? So I said, um, yes, I guess so. So she starts sipping hers, and I think, well, I can, like, fix it, you know? But she's staring at me, and she goes, you're not drinking your tea. <laughs> so, oh, my God, and I'm thinking, what am I going to catch from this cup, you know? And so... Uh, I start sipping my tea, and then she says, um, would you like me to do a portrait of you? And then I thought, well, if I, she does a portrait of me, I have to drink this whole cup of tea, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to. So I said, you know, I really need to get home, and I really regret that I didn't have her um, do that, but um, I did get this, and um, 
I didn't die the next day. I'm still living. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm Kevin Reardon. I have a couple of little stories I'm going to stitch together like she used to stitch her canvases together. So, uh, uh, my wife worked at the museum store, and I have an example of her poetry from them where she used to say, bargains galore in the museum store. So, probably a good thing she knew that. Um, when we told her that we were getting married, she broke into song and sang the entire song of Shuffle Off the Buffalo very nicely, because she thought we should go take a you know, honeymoon in Niagara Falls. Or something. That was kind of cute. But, uh, one time I had the pleasure of uh, introducing her to somebody who was really from France. A friend of a friend of mine was, we were looking at, you know, downtown and by the water tower and we're sitting on the grass and along comes in. Oh, this is Michelle, he's from Paris. And she, oh, you should have seen her light up. Oh, oh, bonjour. to tell us pigeon French, you know. It was completely baffled. You know. But, uh, but, uh, Apropos of the show here, which is wonderful, and I'm sure she would have approved, uh, there was a time when somebody mounted a bunch of her work in the back room at Artemisia on Hubbard Street, mm -hmm. and uh, I went to see it, and I saw her some time later, and I said, did you go see your show? And she said, I have no show. If I had a show, they would have driven me there in a limousine, so there is no show. Okay, you did with her. There. And I'm sure if she was around, you would have driven her to a limousine, a limousine to this opening so. uh, One other thing, I, uh, I got her to uh, agree to let me use one of her drawings in my magazine stare at the time. And uh, I told her, you know, it's like, it's going to be, you know, very low circulation, about 100 copies or whatever. But uh, she said, oh, yeah, there's this new magazine. And she whipped out a copy of interview. The New Chicago Magazine, and there, the cover of it was uh, exactly like the painting she just sold me. <laughs> was, was, but, yeah, she, but she was very cagey about it. She, she said, "Oh yeah," you know. She was trying to hide the fact that it was an actual <laughs> likeness of Barry or something. Uh, on the cover of it, but she was uh, she was great. My one regret is that I took her advice and stuffed the pillow that I got with fresh newspaper. It's probably not the most archival thing, but uh, you know, that's what you said to do. So. <laughs> Don't argue with it. <laughs> Shortly after I met her, we, I was just comment on having a portrait done. <laughs> <laughs> and anything that you really wanted from her, you were not going to get. <laughs> so, and I knew that. So I knew that asking was just not going to get it, you know, but I asked and she just wouldn't even have a conversation with me about it. It was, she would change the topic and, you know, the next week I'd bring it up again and nothing. And this went on for a long time, so I would say probably six or eight months. And, you know, because we spent time together, I knew as much as I, you know, as much information about her as she would share and I told her about myself and my past, my childhood growing up. I grew up in Pennsylvania and, you know, just trying to have conversation. And I just was mad as hell. I couldn't believe that I, she wouldn't do it. And I just thought, okay. So I thought, oh, whatever, I'll give up. And, and one day, it probably was a year, close to a year later, she, I, I was talking to her and I, Ended, you know, we ended our conversation. I was leaving, and she came up behind me, and she handed me a rolled-up canvas, and she said, "Here," and she turned around and left. So I kept it rolled up, and I went home and I opened it, and it's this big painted, like heavily painted and varnished, shellac painting of two birds, and the the top bird is this blue bird that's saying Pittsburgh, which is where I'm from. <laughs> and the bottom bird is a red bird uh, saying Chicago. Oh, wow. wow. And I thought, that's pretty cool. That is cool. <laughs> that is very cool. So I thought maybe, I guess I got the portrait that I wanted. <laughs> so David, wasn't there 
Didn't she say that a red bird was the, he talked to her and told her she should paint? That's, that's what, in, in talking to her, she kept telling us that she was trying to be a poet and sell her poetry, and, and it was, and no one was buying it. And that she, a red bird came to her in a dream and told her, paint. And so she, she said as soon as she started painting, people started buying it. There, according to her, there wasn't really like a lag time. It was a hit. Mm -hmm. Great. Anyone else? I just oh, have a great. tiny little Tell story. It. Go ahead. You want to uh, come up or say that? Come up. My name is Tina, and um, I think she didn't like me, and so she didn't want to sell her <laughs> self portrait to me. And I wanted it badly. And I didn't know how to handle her to get it. And I, and she was on the bridge on Michigan. And I think she started way high in money. And then um, I think I walked away because I thought it was a little much. And then I turned around and then I thought, well, oh, that's kind of dumb, you know? So I went back. But we never really connected. She didn't say much. She didn't, I could tell she didn't like me. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> and now I hear more that she didn't like certain people. I certainly didn't look very fancy, that I know. That may have been the reason, but I do have her self-portrait and I'm very happy I have it. And I also worked at Leo Burnett. And that, at that time, Leo Burnett was in the Prudential Building. And Lee used to also take photographs in the photo booth at the South Shore Station underneath, mm -hmm. you know, between the Cultural Center and the Prudential Building. So she would hang out often around the Prudential Building. And of course, it's full of art directors. So people, uh, it was a great pastime on her lunch hour to go find Lee. <laughs> Lee anyway. And she did not like women as well as men. And David, you know, I'm thinking about that. I think that was right about the time we all started wearing pants to work. Right. You know, so that's probably why. And I would go with my friend Greg or my friend Linda because she loved she she was quite attractive and we liked her. And my friend Greg always wore khakis. So it was a good uh, you know, you kind of got got the idea and everybody would come come back and there were lots of stories about how people would run, you know, she promised she'd hold a painting for them and they'd run the cash machine and by the time they got back, you know, she was either gone or she had sold the, the painting. Was gone. She had sold the painting <laughs> to, someone, to someone else. But um, my last little bit is the first time I ever saw Leah, I had no idea who she was. I was fresh, a, a brand new art director at Leo Burnett and I was, it was right at the very beginning, I was crossing the street at Randolph and so proud of myself and I see this, I see Lee dragging, and we all had portfolios, well here's this, here's Lee with her portfolio and I'm like, oh my god, the ghost of the future or something, I just, I got, she was crossing over and I thought, does she want to get a job at Leo? I'm like, oh, she'll never get a job there, you know. Anyway, later I found out who she was. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Eve and um, it's really fun to hear stories about Leo Burnett because I worked at the flower shop at the South Shore Station uh -huh. from about 1982 to like 1993. So I was in college at Roosevelt University, and that's where I first met Lee. Um, I was a flower girl, first job, big city, very exciting, and she came up to our um, flower display, and they were all organized in bunches, and it was very inexpensive down there. We had you know, 5,000 people every day. And once she just said to me, what is the definition of a bunch? And I was like, oh my gosh, this lady's kind of upset with, about the bunches. And um, anyway, I kind of explained it. She kind of bought something, a bunch of roses actually, uh, uh, walked away and then came back, returned them, asked for her money, and I was polite with her, uh, and uh, she became like a buddy after that. Um, so I knew her for, I would say, that whole time. She was very sweet, 
She gave me tips about um, survival in the city. Tea bags, <laughs> always. <laughs> carry, carry a tea bag, and then you can use any hot water um, faucet in the city. No one will stop you, she told me. Um, just keep that tea bag handy. Um, she, um, she also told me some tips about her, um, the way she kind of handled North Michigan. She said um, she tried to sell things for a cheaper price uh, up and down Michigan, but when she got to North Michigan Avenue, people wouldn't want to pay a lower price. She said she had to go high because otherwise they wouldn't think it was quality. And so she had to go higher when she was at North Michigan. South Michigan, she would drop the price she told me. <laughs> so that was kind of neat. And um, um, I have two pieces. I, I just came in from out of town. I'm a teacher and I was at a, a school conference. and. Um, I, I had two pieces of hers. One was a portrait that she did of me, and one was uh, the ladies with the hats, two of them. Okay. That was pretty neat. So um, she was very special to me. Um, um, and I, I wrote a lot of, about her when I was growing up, um, kind of journals and stories. And the funny thing is, all this Lee stuff is happening right now. And um, in January, I said, you know what? You're a secret writer, Eve. You've got to do something with your writing. So in January, I sat with a friend, and the first thing I thought was, I'm going to write about Lee. So it's kind of neat to see all the Lee stuff right now. And we called her Miss Lee of the Marsh. Okay, uh, I'm, Nancy, I'm Nancy Bechtel, and uh, I've known Tom for a long time, so this is for you, Tom. Um, I was a student at the uh, School of the Art Institute when um, many times I saw her on the stairs of the Art Institute. Uh, she hung out there, and those are the days when people sold art on the streets. Uh, you know, things have changed now. But anyway, uh, you know, I go, go past many times and I think, I want to get one of those. And, um, you know, she'd be there for a while. Of course, you know how she sometimes in the middle of summer wear that big heavy coat yeah. and, you know, like it was, uh, you know, the middle of winter when it was the summer. And uh, I just said hi to a few times. And I said, gee, I said, you know, I, I um, how much do you want for that? And she said $25. And being a student, I only have five dollars on me. And I'm like, oh, I've only got five. And she says, well, it's 25. I said, okay, I'll come back tomorrow. I came back the next day and I said, well, you know, uh, I'm back and I got $25. You, you know, you said you'd sell me that. I says, that's really great. Um, and I'm an artist too, got it up. And she looks at me and she says, no, today it's $4.50. And I said, I said 450. She said, you're an art student. You should know the art world. The prices always go up. <laughs> the filmmaker and she made a film on Chris Drew. Have any of you heard of him? Very interesting film. Who was arrested? He was trying to uh, sell. I don't think uh, Lee was ever arrested, but Chris Drew was arrested trying to sell his artwork on the street. Interesting film there. Can they go online? And uh, yeah, I've got some postcards with me if anybody's interested. Great. But um, he ended up in the in a free speech case with the Where? First Amendment. With the First Amendment, uh -huh. he had two pro bono lawyers, and um, it was the uh, yeah he was charged with first class felony. It's a long story and it's quite a good one. Right. Street artist himself. Amazingly, Lee was never. I know that the Art Institute, when she was out in front, they would try and put, get her away, shoo her away uh, uh, many times. Uh, one quick story that I've heard from one of the people we interviewed, uh, someone uh, asked her uh, actually uh, um, to go by, uh, when, when she was standing in front of the galleries on Michigan Avenue where Frumpkin used to be and uh, places like that, uh, so, but she had a baby at the time and she had a stroller and the person who asked her to buy the painting said, offer her $300. She went up to Lee, who was on, on the street there on Michigan Avenue, offered her $300. We had a stroller, and Lee said, I don't sell paintings to pregnant, to, to uh, pregnant mothers. Or maybe she was pregnant and not, uh, uh, so she had strict guidelines about uh, who she would sell to. Another quick story we I've heard is uh, a friend had a double portrait made of his, his girlfriend and himself, and uh, the girlfriend broke up with uh, him, so the girlfriend cut the picture in half and took her self-portrait. Uh, she will not let us photograph 
that picture, but, but the guy will let us uh, photograph his half. <laughs> anyone else? Anyone else have it? Good. I, I'd like to just say thanks to everyone for sharing. Um, I, I'm in the art, I have, I have a picture frame shop and I've worked with Lee's work for like the past 20 years. <laughs> I've framed a good portion of the show for different <laughs> collectors. Um, yeah, so dealing with people like Carl Hammer and uh, Karen Lennox, I, I hear secondhand stories. I was never fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to have met her, depending on how I dressed, apparently. But I, I've heard a lot of the stories secondhand, and it's it's great to hear firsthand stuff and just see how much people still love and appreciate her and keep it alive. Do you give discounts to an intimate member? Uh, yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> I also have cards if you want to. So it was 1993. It was the Cultural Center retrospective, 20-year retrospective, and Carl got a limousine to bring Lee, Lee Godey and Bonnie over to the show. And in they her got fur coat. Their, what? In her fur coat. In her fur coat, yes. And Lee was really intimidated by the crowds. And she just kind of retreated into herself. And I, I said, you know, Lee, like, is there something I can do? Do you want to go somewhere? And she said, I want to go for a ride in the limousine. So I said, OK. So I went to Bonnie and Lee in the limousine. And I asked her where she wanted to go. She had no idea. She just wanted to drive. And I said, why don't we go to the IC station and take photo booth pictures? Oh. <laughs> and so we went there. And she took pictures. I took pictures with her. Bonnie took pictures and the three of us together. And then Lee looked at him, and she did not like the way she looked. So I got all the pictures. Uh, I retired a while back. And uh, we have a trailer for our film, which will also give you, Capra, a, a website where if you want to donate to our film. Yes, LeeGodeyMovie.com. So you can become a crew member, an editor, or a producer and help with the completion. Uh, I just, uh, last month, got a grant from the city um, to help fund getting rights to use some of the uh, footage from the, uh, the TV stations to get music rights, things like that. So we you know that really what? makes Tom feel like a waste of money. <laughs> no. uh, but uh, I just got a grant for that, and then we'll be hopefully um, looking for some other sources to finish up. Most of the shooting is done except for a few um, people that we still are wanting, like uh, David, the two days, um, to uh, interview locally. Have you interviewed Mark Jackson? Oh, yes. He was one of the first people we interviewed. Yeah, right. Yeah. That, that told us to went to her funeral. What was his name? He said, Michael Thompson. Um, just quickly, and this might be a good way to end this. Oh, well, it, it just, we interviewed Michael Thompson, who actually went to her funeral, which was very, very touching, he said. She was there in full makeup uh, in her casket, and uh, it, he, it was sweet the way he told that. It was similar. People stood up and told stories uh, for now. Well, were you you yeah. were there at the funeral also. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, right, there was similar. There were stories about her. Uh, yeah. Great, terrific. All right, so we're going to see. What are we going to see, Kevin? Our trailer. Our trailer. <laughs> and, and selected interviews from some of the people we have in front already. As somebody who's very interested in Chicago and trying to figure out what it's all about. Lee Godey's work, and Lee Godey herself, is very Chicago. The whole spirit of the city that made it what it is are people who are outsiders, people who kind of came from another place, from a different perspective that didn't fit in, that asserted their own individuality and created something amazing in the process. Before I knew who she was, I would see this strange lady walking down Michigan Avenue. I remember seeing her um, with this head on, with these cherries on the brim one day, and then a couple days later, it was the same hat, straw hat that she had inverted, and all the cherries were hanging around <laughs> her face. And I knew some friends who had some of her work, and I liked it. 
And then one day I saw this same woman, and it was July, and she had this fur jacket on. And I thought, what's strange about this person? And I realized it was like 90 degrees out. So I turned around and ran up to her and asked her if she was the Cody, the famous artist. And she said, yes, she was. And so at least then I knew who she was. I didn't buy anything from her that day, but I told her that I had seen her work at my friend's place and I really liked it and I was honored to meet her, which she really liked a lot. Yeah, she told me that a red bird had told her to paint and um, I think that's why, especially when she gave, when she, I bought the portrait and she flipped over this painting and it wasn't a red bird, it was a rock. I consider this very outsider too. She'd take a, a roll of canvas and she'd paint several pictures on it and then she'd cut them. We bought several of the, the pieces that are multiple images sewn together, uh, including one of the, the so-called red party which is the other incident that I, of course, remember particularly well, uh, which was Lee organized, I think through Lolly Thurm, in, um, I think in 1975. And it was an early morning event in front of what was then the Standard Oil building, now, now the, uh, the Aeon uh, building, and in the park across from that building. And Lee had organized it uh, around a tree that had red blooms. It, there was the tree. And the work she had brought, obviously for sale, uh, were all works that had red in them or red backgrounds. Uh, we bought a three-part piece that had you know, this very bright, bright red background. Even though she was doing the archetypes at the beginning, and even at the end, a uh, few of them that remained, um, it's really the early work that I think is the most powerful, and they don't fall into any kind of repetitious archetypal um, image, which I think we've all associated with Lee just, just over the years because we see the same things that she cranked out over and over again during the last 10 years of her life. But I think from about 1968, the very beginning that we know about her making work, and probably up until at least 1980, she was, do, she was doing a lot of, of different kinds of things um, all, the portrait, all the portraits that she did do all look different, and they all look like different people. Um, she could sometimes get the likeness of someone in an uncanny way. It would be interesting to do an exhibition with nothing but uh, Lee Goni works with the John Hancock building, which sometimes she just totally abstracted, you know, it would be a, a vase and the Hancock building. Um, I was either buying a work or saw a work or was talking to her and she had a, a painting that said Chicago we own it and um, so I asked her about it and she said I saw a bumper sticker that said Florida we own it so I thought Chicago we own it. The purity of her her practice with you know it, it was something so fresh and so honest and clear about her work and um, uh, I guess I, the attraction to it in that regard, just uh, seeing a kind of, well, a beauty about it, a simplicity and beauty, and maybe just the, the direct thing that she trusted in herself to make the work. So as a young artist sitting, you know, on the steps with her, you know, I guess that was, for me, very, it still is very inspiring. And she asked me to join her for lunch. And so her place to eat was what was then known as Heel Square. And it was basically this little tri like a little pedestrian triangle, right almost in the middle of Wacker Drive. There was traffic all around it. The plaza was tiny. There was a big Laredo Taft sculpture of George Washington and others standing. And this is where she wanted to have our lunch. She had gotten hot water from a little corporal restaurant. She pulled out a tea bag that she had in her bag, which looked like it had been very well used, but she then used to make some tea. And then for the main course, she pulls out what were once Oreo cookies. It's just the two chocolate wafers. The cream filling in the middle had somehow disappeared. I don't know how it disappeared. I don't think about it too much. In its place were slices of chicken. And so I had this wonderful tea 
and chicken and Oreo sandwich and conversed with Lee Goaty. It was one of the nicest lunches I've ever had in my life. Finally this evening, there actually is a biblical injunction against hiding one's light under a bushel. And it comes to mind in connection with one of the many bag ladies who managed to live on the streets of Chicago. As ABC's Jerry King reports, there's a lot more to Lee Goatee than meets the eye. At, at first glance, Lee Goatee looks like just another bag lady. She's a homeless derelict, but Lee Goatee is more than that. She is also an artist, a somewhat eccentric artist. One, one, fellow, one fellow said, Lee, he wrote me a note. He said, Lee, you bring, you bring color to Chicago. In art circles here, she is becoming very collectible. More than 50 of her canvases hang on the walls in collector Kenneth Walker's home. We really put some sort of category which we call outsider art, which means uh, art made by people who work outside of the mainstream. He likes it, but Lee Godet's unschooled style is not universally admired. Some people take that to mean a greater amount of freedom. Um, and, and also the, uh, the notion that uh, this is somehow more significant because it comes together almost by accident. Lee Godet sells most of her works from her home, the streets, where the reviews are also mixed. Her artwork, I think, is primitive, but then I'm seeing the artwork with her. Take that artwork and put it in a fancy gallery in Michigan Avenue, and it might sell. It is Lee Godet's rough lifestyle that helps to sell her paintings, using bus station lockers to store her worldly possessions. Still, it's life on her terms, says collector Kenneth Walker, so don't pity her. Well, I've sat with her on park benches late at night, and I realized what an extraordinary life she has kind of living under the stars in Chicago. Lee Godet's paintings sell sometimes for $10, sometimes for 100 depending on her mood. And that changes quickly. Harry King, ABC News, Chicago. That's our report on World News tonight. Besides Bonnie. He, besides Bonnie, who's still alive. Um, and so a lot of the time I spent after we started <clears throat> our initial interviews with people was really researching, finding family. Uh, a couple of months ago I was in Idaho uh, and uh, I actually have one photo of Lee when she was probably 20 uh, oh, wow. with uh, nine of her sisters. She had a very large nice family. There were 11 in the family. And these are women in probably mid to late 20s. Um, the, this niece who has the family photo would not let me use the entire photo. I could only use the image of Lee. Um, as a young woman, she was beautiful. Yeah, I she she was beautiful. I mean, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. No, all the girls were. But it's such an amazing photograph because they are, there's an upright piano. And the girls are on top of the piano, they're on the bench, they're on the floor. She's off to the side. The niece thinks that they were uh, in uh, pajamas, but they all had stockings and good shoes on. And I, because it was a formal photograph, like an 8 by 10, I'm wondering if it was the wedding of perhaps one of the brothers. Mm -hmm. Because the girls, I think, were more in slips with Stop. She, I, you know, I wasn't going to, to disagree with her niece as to whether this was a summer party or not. They really weren't in what I would call pajamas. Right. They had cigarettes. They were uh -huh. damping it up. Um, it's an amazing photograph that, um, that they have of, of her and the family. But the family, just like Bonnie is to a certain extent, they're all very reserved. It was very difficult finding anyone in the family um, that was still alive or had family photos or were willing to talk or give information um, on, on the family. Mm -hmm. 
Didn't she lose a child? Uh, she some, lost two. Or something two lost children? Two. She lost a child with early childhood. Okay. They were uh, two and six. Two and six. Sad. And, uh, yes. She she archived in the Chicago Artists Archive and the uh, Harold Washington Library. I don't know. know. She should be obviously because it's uh, there's like eleven thousand artists in there, nineteen forty three on. Uh, and it, well, you don't have to have been it. born here, just as long as you did acknowledge to work here, and not just as a student. Well, so, she was born in Chicago. Yeah, she so, grew up across from Dummy. That's great. And so, obviously, uh, Tell her Road is, you know, get her archives. You know, I mean, you've got enough to archive her with. You know, she's been displayed in galleries, and she's got a history like this. This, this could be archived in it, because there's 11,000 in the archivist, Leslie Patterson. And she's on the eighth floor of our watch. Yes. Have you had any contact with Bonnie? She has. I have. Mm -hmm. Bonnie was not willing to get involved uh, in the movie in the beginning. Um, she was willing to take a look at it when we got farther along in the edit. Um, I'm hoping that at that point she might, you know, consider getting involved in some level. Um, you know, I basically asked because I assume she has some photo of her father uh, and the uh, Leonie um, Massine portrait that Picasso did, supposedly from people who we interviewed, and, and it's written about too, um, looked like her first husband. And uh, that would have been Bonnie's father. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping to be able to at least find a photo of, of George Chapelet. Yes. I have a question. Uh, in, your, in the first film that you showed that you're working on, the gentleman at the Tree Studio who had like 400 uh, works of art, what happened there? Did they, were they returned to it's her? It's a complicated story. Uh, they, they ended up with Carl Hammer, I think, afterwards. But and they, Bonnie, there was some litigation involved. It's an interesting story. Uh, he doesn't want to reveal too much. Okay. So <laughs> and hopefully we can, I'll watch the film. <laughs> we're, we're still figuring it out. But too. okay. And eventually, got back to her estate, so to speak. I mean, Carl was her dealer, so. Carl was her dealer, I mean, he didn't, this person who happened to luck out and get them didn't profit by it. No. He tried, but did, did not. She really loved Carl and wanted to marry him and move to the suburbs. <laughs> well, but he told me that when she ran into him in jeans, she told him to go home and change clothes, and then she talked to him. All right. <laughs> so anyway, anything else? Otherwise, we'll wrap it up for tonight. Oh yes. How do you plan on releasing the film? Pardon me. How do you plan on releasing the film? Are you have a, like, are you going to release it online? Are you going to have a public premiere? Do you guys know that? Public here? Public career? Yeah. Maybe here. Okay. Maybe here, yes. Yeah. Do you plan on doing like a release online or anything like that? Like selling it online? Yeah, put it on YouTube. YouTube. You guys plan on releasing it online? I was just curious. Oh, that who way. knows? Who, you know. Yeah, because I'd be really interested to see it. Too. Ask us in two years when we finish it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now you're being pessimistic. Okay, what do you want to have it done next What's your Wall Street story? Oh, yeah. I just. Film festivals. I just I film festivals. It's already better than almost there. <coughs> Back She's in the, one uh, of the most interesting <laughs> outsider artists because we have so much material on her too. Uh, whereas a lot of outsider artists, it's hard hard to get into their lives as much as we've been able to through people like you. Uh, stories. Yes. There was uh, back in the heyday of her fame with the Peter Jennings and everything. I, they did an article on her in the Wall Street Journal. That's right. The Wall Street Journal. About eighty-six or seven or something like that. And, and, and her prices went up. Right? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, you probably wouldn't learn anything you didn't already know about her from that. But they did the you know they had the drawing like they always do in the Wall Street Journal. They never had photographs, so they had what? like their version of a drawing of her, which is uh, we have a stack great. of material. There have been so many shows that she's had to. Uh, so this is the second one here, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Here. Second, oh, second here? At least. At least the no, second well, one. I curated a show, I guess, 10 years ago of the photo. But she, yeah, yeah, but then you and had... And then we had a retrospective. Then you had another... We had two other shows besides yeah. this one, I think. But, um, yeah, I think three. But, you know, there was a huge article 
and the reader to it one time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I do remember that. Yeah, people maybe people people right after all the people yeah. mm -hmm. I have that issue if you need it for. Oh, really? Did you have it? Um, kind of? I think if I have, I don't think I have the people magazine. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of coverage. Um, that even in Greece, we had someone that I interviewed who was uh, what was called her Greek banker. <laughs> and actually, there was a bank of Greece on Michigan Avenue near the Sun Times building, and she talked to him just opening the bank account. And she left $400 and some of her art there in the bank for about a week, and then she came and went through it all. <laughs> but, um, and he, she wrote about him buying one of her prints in her journal. So, you know, it's documented in terms of, you know, I've seen there was something about the Greek banker and he's been able to, just by default, back and down. Mm -hmm. People in art supply stores would, uh, uh, Jeff Goldstein, mm -hmm. for one, would help her, you know, would, when she was buying work, uh, only charge her half and so forth. Oh, even less than that. Unless she would go through the remainders, he said, of like, paper, you know, that had a little nick on it or something, and they'd put it in the back on sale. And she'd come with a stack, you know, a couple of inches thick, and he'd give it to her for 50 cents. Right. So, she had to use those wildlings for her sometimes to get those little paint sets, those children's sets that was in one of the, one of the clips. They they just, yeah, paint sets and things like that. And she actually told me when that People article had happened in the Wall Street Journal, they came to the train station to interview people and they asked me if I would talk about her. And I said that I wouldn't because she told me that anytime there was an article or some kind of coverage, um, she got mugged. You know, she, she used to keep big wads of money in her portfolio. She yeah. showed them to me. And I was always so frightened for her. But she she frightened her socks then later. Yeah. She put a little money here, but all the yeah. big money in her socks. But she said that after some article came out, then people, more people knew about her, and she was vulnerable then, so. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sure she was several yeah. times. Did you, the, the people at Baltimore used to, are her. Did you? Uh, we're care. still trying to get those. Yeah, because I, I, they protected her. I mean, she yeah. used to hang out there, and I think they, they took care of her. Yeah. And actually, you know, that's how I first met her. I knew of her, but when I started working at the Art Institute in '81, I was the first star. And one day, I heard this voice because the, there were two little windows at the kind of cashier window to the first song. And he sat down a little lower and suddenly I gave this, oh, banker, banker, <laughs> can I have some clean money? <laughs> and she had these wadded up $20 bills that were damp. <laughs> and she would start unfolding them and ask for crisp, clean 20s. So that's how I first met her. <laughs> It's going to be an epic movie, as you can see. <laughs> yes. Any, anything else? Should we wrap it up for tonight? <coughs> or Thank should we you just all stay for here and thank you all? Thank you.